the other thing I want to get back into the regulatory strategy and in terms of companies, and I know from my experience, you know, I got clinical background, come from a marketing business development sales in the corporate world before uh, starting, starting this business. But you oftentimes see companies that are um, regulatory and R&D driven versus marketing and sales, for instance. And what I'd like you to speak to, again, the importance of regulatory having a seat at the table. I personally believe that if your company is not R&D regulatory quality driven, that your sustainability is going to be much more challenged and you're going to have more opportunities to get in trouble, so to speak. So I'd love for you to speak to that from your experience. So I have a lot to say on this topic. And <laughs> and uh, the first actually is is the most important. And, and because we hear a lot when we talk about medical device companies in particular as either being sales or marketing driven or R&D driven. Mm -hmm. really product focused or really market focused, but 100% of all businesses are profit focused and you, yeah. we need to make money. And so I know we, and we can do that by, you know, by helping patients have high quality, you can have these, th these things, but at the end of the day, we need to make money. So whatever strategies we decide on, they need to be intelligently planned such that at the end of the day, we're a profitable business. So, um, I, I came to this, actually, I did take notes. Uh, I wrote some notes uh, on some topics that did get missed a lot. And I'd like to bring up because they're really important for strategy. Excellent. And one is getting back to the long game is that for regulatory purpose, we have to consider claims. We have to consider performance carefully for the total product life cycle for the product. So if you have an implant, for example, that's going to be a permanent implant, then we're going to have a patient base that's going to have this product in their body even after we sell it. So uh, what are we going to, what is the plan? What is the five-year plan? What is the 10-year plan? And for, for the whole life cycle of this, this product. And it's really important to think about that um, as, as I know it's exciting. We went to a trade show or there's some kind of meeting with a, a KOL, an industry leader that's really excited about a new technology, a new shiny thing. And we want to get into it and add it to our portfolio. But let's step back a little bit and look at the practicality of doing it. And over the life cycle, what will that require? And if we have, um, if we're going into to major markets like China, Russia, Japan, uh, Australia, and you're going into some of these countries that, it, that the, the, they need to look at the rigor throughout the life cycle. What are the change notice requirements? What are the renewal requirements? Um, the other thing that gets missed a lot is the, the cost assessment is not complete. And what happens is that because we're thinking, you know, total product life cycle, excuse me, I just have to pop into my notes here, um, is that we're, you have costs for your renewals. If you have local product testing, you have to pay for those units. Or do we need clinical data? Well, we need a clinical trial. Are we gonna do, um, what about manufacturing site changes? If you're adding manufacturing sites, changing a legal manufacturer site, that could that that whole submission it throws over it throws uh, a big wrench into your whole product portfolio. So if you want to like three years in, then change your manufacturing site, then you're going to have a whole slew of, of submissions activity to go along with that. So that needs we need to keep that in mind if we want to launch you know this cool product, but then we know we're going to have this change down the road and we could be midway through our our submissions globally. Um, which are obviously we've built a revenue stream around it. So, uh, or projections about how much money we're going to make this all factors in and it often does not all get included. The, uh, the other thing that gets missed uh, a lot is translation costs. And we, because we have to submit in these row markets in local language and we, uh, and you could have uh, the, this, if you're, especially if you're working on a high risk device, your dossiers are going to be quite extensive. Your labeling is probably going to be uh, extensive. Your operator manuals, tech service manuals, things of this nature, they all have to be translated as well as your dossier. So you could be easily spending in the, into the six figures just to translate. Now add in if you're doing your the submission fees, plus when you're doing your renewals, your renewal fees, any additional change, you know, any technical um, remedial testing, anything you have to do for that, plus new translation costs for those it gets it it's a lot so if so, you know, so 
Yeah. So uh, uh, just a couple of things that popped into my mind as you were going through some of that. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, certainly in terms of uh, your forecasting is extremely important. And from a manufacturing standpoint, depending on how that product does, you know, are you going to scale up? I just uh, put out a, a video based on an article on planning for your tech for, for biologics. And as you go through that clinical phase and then are you going to scale up? Are you going to scale out? Are you going to use contract manufacturers? Um, the challenges with the technology transfer. So you're talking about from that standpoint, if you don't have enough space and a lot of, a lot of times people start and then they'll transfer, you know, overseas, for example. So all that complexity, you got to be aware of, of what that looks like up front. Um, Cause again, from a cost standpoint, from an efficiency standpoint, it's extremely important. That's true. And then, and what you're touching on is also getting into sub to subjects like rules of origin which are important for your your customs but also for your labeling and um, as well as for for manufacturer site qualification which is um, there are some countries that will say oh well this product is made in say china we don't trust that quality so we won't allow that here and so or they're gonna they're gonna want to audit wherever that supplier is and i've actually experienced that before and so we need to be we need to be careful and and do full full vetting uh, before we implement big changes like that. Um, the last thing it, to consider too, is if the country requires local, like post-market uh, support, do you have to have a local agent? Do they have to do post-market reporting? Do they have to have a QMS framework there for distribution? And, and, and think about that as well. And all of that should be bundled into your initial strategy, your rollout plan, uh, as well as your cost a cost benefit assessment. And I mean, you look at what's going on uh, with the MDR, the IVDR, certainly the liability. That's a big aspect of it. Uh, everybody has more skin in the game from a liability standpoint. It's interesting you were talking about uh, in terms of the in interpretation piece, translation piece, right? Uh, we've done um, business for the most part of the last uh, five plus years been in the United States, but we've worked on uh, in Canada and in, in Europe and are looking at some things in the Far East right now. And even from that standpoint, thinking about how that recruiting process looks like uh, the client, are they going to need interpreters? I mean, that whole, f you know, that cost factors in significantly for us as well, looking at something like that. So um, uh, that's that's awesome. I really appreciate you, you sharing some perspective there uh, from a strategy standpoint and how those tie together. <music>